A very good afternoon, everyone. And thank you so much for joining us this afternoon for this amazing session on Mastering Business Writings, Tips and Techniques for Effective Communications. Strong writing skills are essential for anyone in business. You need them to effectively communicate with colleagues, employees, and bosses, and to sell any ideas, products, or services you are offering. We have an amazing trainer with us today to take us through the journey of business writings for the second time with us is Mr. Sanjay Verma. He's a writer and broadcaster and has over 35 years of experience working on both sides of communication spectrum as a journalist and as head of branding corporates communications with several top companies. He was a senior editor with publications like Business India and the Sunday Observer. He has managed corporate communications for brands like Max, New Work Life, Dell, Reliance Powers, and Mosa Beer. Lexis is his entrepreneurial venture that specializes in creating content for companies big and small and regularly conducts writing skill workshops for corporate tech executives and entrepreneurs. A warm welcome to you, sir, and thank you so much for joining us. And over to you. Thank you. Thanks so much, Venkat, for that wonderful introduction. Um, hello, good afternoon to all. I'm going to share my screen and we'll begin. I'll speak a little bit um, about myself, about a minute or so, and then we'll get into what we're going to be discussing today. Um, so just give me a minute. I'll go full screen. You see my screen, Venkat? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay, so we're here to talk about um, better business writing. We all write. We are all writers. If we, we could be in the corporate world. We are business managers um, or business executives, if you like, but um, we all write for a living. Um, so I'm going to tell you a little bit about myself. I'm a writer and broadcaster. I'm now a communication skills coach. Um, I had uh, visited Cambridge University in UK in the year 2002. I was a visiting fellow. Um, I'm passionate about all manner of good things of life, cinema, classical Western music, travel. I also live to eat. Um, and I have a contract with Macmillan India for writing two books, one on Indian cinema and the other on Indian cuisine. So um, writing skills count. That's the first thing that, that I'd like to say to you. Good writing makes a difference in career advancement. I don't say it. Fortune magazine, which is one of the world's leading business magazines, uh, they conducted a survey in 2001 and again in 2012. They refreshed that survey. And the findings were that good writing put your career graph um, on skids. You can rise faster in an organization if you have good writing skills. So this uh, Fortune magazine uh, survey it covered um, 50 Fortune 500 US companies and its salient findings were the following. Emails, memos, proposals, letters, presentations, marketing materials, or whatever you write on your computer or mobile device, whether you are SMSing or texting, it all constitutes writing. So your writing skills are on display as never before in the workplace. So I've spoken to many HR heads and recruitment agencies, and they all confirm that communication skills are often a primary hiring consideration at major corporations. And good writing skills mean credibility. So the writer tends to come across as less intelligent and capable if you don't write well. And people who write well are usually perceived as more competent and more intelligent. So it's directly linked to credibility. Now, um, bad writing is like stale food. It is unpalatable. It's difficult to put down your gullet. Uh, because it's stale and it's sickly, it's bereft of calories, it's devoid of nutrition, and it's completely 
unsatisfying. Now, this is a joint. Uh, this is a job description that I picked up um, uh, from the web. This is for a healthcare company, and I have absolutely no idea what it's saying. The area vice president, enterprise customers will develop and manage a sustainable strategic relationship that transforms the current commercial model by creating joint value that results in the ongoing reduction of costs, continuous process improvement, growth and profitability for both partners with the ability to export key learnings. It's uh, it's gobbledygook. I have no clue what, what the job description is. What am I supposed to do? If I want to apply for this job, what will be my responsibility? Um, companies talk about full services solutions provider. Google, if you do a Google search, it shows 94,000 companies that use this line, full services um, solutions provider. No one, of course, uh, claims to be a half solutions provider. Likewise, cost-effective end-to-end solutions. You key this into Google and it brings you about 95,000 results. So um, I have still to make my acquaintance with somebody who says, I'm not cost-effective. Um, so these are some of the things that, you know, that, that we need to keep in mind um, when we're talking about good, effective writing. The good thing is that everyone can learn to be a good writer, everybody. It's, you know, there are some endeavors in, in, in life, such as music and art and, and dance, perhaps, which need a degree of uh, inborn talent. So Mozart, who is the greatest musician that ever lived, um, he was five years old when he created his first piece of music, five years old. Now, um, that's, that's a gift that it, it's a, it's a, you know, touch of genius. Um, but nobody does that. You wouldn't have ever have heard of a five-year-old uh, boy or a girl who's a brilliant writer. It doesn't happen like that. It's a natural process. It takes time and everybody can learn to write well. Um, and that's what we are here to talk about. Um, you should write as you speak. This is um, a point that I almost belabor when I uh, do my writing skills programs. Business writing or any writing, but particularly business writing, it needs to convey the rhythm of human speech. So you must use words that have air around them. Write as you speak and say what you want to in as few words as possible. What this will do is it will invite your audience to read. It will be a straight line from what you want to convey to the reader's reaction to your words. You all with me? Am I going too fast? Do I need to slow down? Do I... You want to ask me any questions? Uh, we, of course, have half an hour at the end um, uh, for questions. But um, uh, should you really want to interrupt me and ask a question, I'm okay with that. But let it be a relevant question to what, to what we are discussing at that particular moment. Um, so let me carry on since I didn't hear um, any comments uh, or should I be checking comments, uh, Venkat, on chat? No, it is not required, sir. If anything is there, I'll be assisting to, you. To look at it. So far, okay. going good. Great. Um, before we talk about what we need to do to, to, to be effective uh, business writers, I want to talk about five characteristics of bad business writing. I don't like saying bad, so I'd, I'd actually rephrase it. Poor business writing. Um, so here's the first one. You're not sure what the writer is trying to say. It takes an eternity for the person to get to the point. You don't want to read an email or a document that somebody has written where the point of writing that mail or the document is not immediately clear. Um, the other characteristic is that you're writing to impress, not to express. So always write to express. Don't, don't ever write to impress. There's no need to display your erudition, how great your vocabulary is and so on. Um, bad writing is, or poor writing is also long and ponderous. It goes around in circles and you're not quite sure where it's getting to. Um, the writer tends to rely on tired cliches 
Clichés are these stock phrases that um, we tend to use. It becomes a habit if we if we use them. So phrases like, you know, let's avoid it like the plague or let's not have the pot calling the kettle black and these kind of cliched phrases, uh, they're strictly avoidable in, in uh, any kind of writing, especially in business writing. Also, the writing is replete with unforced errors. So um, it's it's got spelling mistakes and got poor punctuation and the impact all this has is negative on the person who is um, reading um, this piece of writing. Um, so now I'm going to, you know, I'm, I'm only going to focus on five characteristics of good business writing. Um, business writing is not something that, um, you know, I can, I can talk about in an, in an hour and you will sort of, um, um, uh, you know, get it all, grasp it all. I usually do um, a 24-hour basic writing skills program. So when I say 24 hours, it doesn't mean that I speak continuously for 24 hours, starting at uh, 3.30 one day and ending the next day at 3.30. So it's divided over um, about 12 sessions of two hours each, or it could be six sessions of uh, four hours each. Um, but that's that's a session that I conduct for corporate executives, for middle and senior executives. And um, uh, uh, and and that's, you know, I, I, I believe that if... if um, you go through a program like that, at the end of it, um, your writing skills will move from point one to uh, point two. But um, a session like this, one can only, uh, 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 you know, sort of bookmark four or five main points. And, um, and that's what I'm trying to do in this session. So um, these are the five characteristics of uh, good business writing that I've identified. Planning is one, simplicity, Revising, you must revise what you've written. Uh, hook, which I will describe what I mean by hook. And um, finally, brevity. Brevity, of course, relates to keeping it short. Whatever it is that you have to say, always keep it short. So I'm going to go over these five characteristics one by one. I have examples. And here, if you want to ask me anything in particular about something that I've said, which um, you disagree with or you strongly agree with, please um, do ask me. But like I said, we'll have half an hour at the end for you to ask questions. So uh, plan your writing is the first thing that I want to say. Um, don't ever write without a plan. Um, so whether you're writing a 10,000 word report or you're writing a letter of complaint, you can create a small structure of what your main points are going to be and then write to that plan. Uh, to write well, you need to pre-write, you need to think, you need to research, you need to plan, organize, draft, revise, rethink, analyze, and you also need to meet your deadlines. So it sounds like a very forbidding thing, you know, that there's something major that you are attempting to do. Um, it, it doesn't work like that. You can spend a couple of minutes on each of these elements and a piece of writing can come together. And when I say that don't ever write without a plan, I don't mean that if you have to tweet, which is uh, 280 characters, that you sort of do a structure of what you're going to tweet about. That's not what I'm saying. But uh, most writing, important email that you're writing to a client, just collect your thoughts. Think of the one or two messages that you want to capture in your uh, uh, mail and then write to that plan. So planning what you're going to write is critical. Um, it's almost the first step. I mean, it is the first step. Um, when you plan how to write, it's about, um, you, you know, in marketing and um, or whatever else you studied in college, you would have come across these five W's and one H. Um, you answer these six questions, you'll essentially get what your writing should contain. So you answer... Uh, who, what, when, where, why, and how. Who will read what you're writing? What are you writing about? When, uh, so the time frame that you're talking about, where, where will it be read? Um, or where is it happening? You know, you're talking about uh, the inauguration of a power plant or something. You need to talk about where it's happening. Why is it happening? And how is it happening? You answer these 
six questions. Um, that's that's a complete piece of writing in business terms. Think of your audience before you write a word, even before you commit the first word to paper. If you think of who's going to read what you're writing, um, you will usually get it right. So know your purpose, know your audience, and establish a structure. Uh, let's move on to the next element. I talked about five elements that I'm going to talk about. Here's the next one. This is simplicity. So good writing is simple writing. And simplicity, I believe, is the ultimate sophistication. And simplicity doesn't mean simplicity of thought. Your thoughts can be very complex, but when you express them in your writing, express them as simply as you possibly can. Um, simple exp expression, make no um, mistake about it, is hard work. So proliferation of gross and pretentious words, it's, I call it the curse of the technology age. Um, bureaucrats and politicians, uh, they usually avoid simple speech for three reasons. They want to speak in a manner that thoroughly confuses you. Um, they speak in shorthand for insiders. So, you know, people um, who are bureaucrats and politicians will understand what, what is being said. But um, a lay person um, will, will struggle to understand. They use this sort of language to obscure and avoid difficult questions. And um, um, they also do it to avoid the hard work of simple expression. Um, so here's something that, um, that I love saying. Do you want to write smart, witty, clever, creative, insightful, brainy, surprising, fresh, analytic, scintillating, engaging, and also thrilling and rousing prose. These are 13 adjectives that I've used. If you want to write well, never use any of these 13 words. Um, use adjectives only to express something very specific or set up a description. Um, mostly writing should comprise, especially business writing, should comprise um, verbs and nouns and adverbs perhaps, but adjectives you should use very sparingly. Um, in almost most situations, I would say you can, you know, you can um, avoid using adjectives. Uh, incredible is, a, is an adjective that's very popular with millennials, uh, with young people. Um, so I have a son who's a millennial and um, when you know, I ask him, so son, how is the dinner today? How's how do you like it? He says, incredible. Um, what what was um, you know the film like, or how was school today, or how was college today? And he'd say, awesome, awesome, incredible. So nothing uh, nothing is normal. It's awesome or incredible. These are tiresome adjectives. So I, I, of course, am an insufferable person and I tell my son that he shouldn't be using these words. Um, but, um, but these are adjectives that in business language have no, no place at all. Uh, let's, let's talk about um, uh, you know, words. So never use words that you don't know the meaning of. Um, just never do it. It's, it's one of those things that uh, you can do without. Um, so a prize and a praise. Um, I received a mail the other day where um, the person said, I'll appraise you um, shortly. Um, what he meant was that he'll appraise me shortly. He will inform me shortly. But he said, I'll appraise you shortly. Appraise means to assess you know, your appraisal, your performance appraisal. So it has a completely different meaning from a prize. They look very similar, meanings very different. Intense and intensive. So intense means something that is of extreme force or degree. Um, intensive, on the other hand, uh, means very thorough or vigorous. So you have intensive care unit in a hospital. It means a place where um, you are put through a very um, thorough care. That's what it means. Uh, beside and besides, um, beside means something which is next to you, and besides means in addition to. That, that's the difference between the two words. You need to be absolutely clear what, what is it that you want to use. Sight, 
spelt with a C and site spelt with an S have completely different meanings. C-I-T-E, site, um, means to uh, refer to something or to, to cite an example. I pick up an example to say something that I'm saying. That word is site with a C. However, uh, site with an S is a location. The building site, for instance, uh, that's spelled with an S. Disperse and disperse. Now, um, disperse and disperse. Disperse is to pay out. So at the end of the month, your salary will be disbursed. It will be paid out. Dispersed, on the other hand, means something that is spread out over a wide area. It could be a storm, it could be light, it could be smoke. Uh, that is That word is disperse. Condole and condone. Um, they sound similar, but to condole is to express sympathy with something that's gone wrong. So um, if there's been a death, you will condole with, with, um, with a surviving member of that family. Um, to condone is to accept behavior that is wrong or offensive. So uh, uh, you cannot condone bad behavior from politicians. I mean, just as an example. So condole and condone, completely different words. They look similar, but they're not. Illegible and unreadable. When I say something is illegible, what I'm saying is that it is hard to read. The handwriting is so poor that it's illegible. I'm having trouble reading it. Um, when I call this call something unreadable, I'm commenting on the quality of writing. So I'm not talking about handwriting. I'm talking about um, the quality of writing, the poor expression. So illegible is poor handwriting, whereas unreadable is um, uh, poverty of thought. Uh, eminent and imminent. Uh, eminent is, you know, eminent uh, poet is somebody who's who's recognized and, and is an accomplished uh, writer, eminent. Imminent, on the other hand, is something that is about to happen. Imminent disaster. Uh, let's not talk about disaster. So imminent, uh, uh, you know, something nice that is about to happen. You will say it is imminent. It is about to happen. So use uh, uh, simple words and never use words that you don't know the meaning of. Um, brevity, we're still with the brevity. Um, I'd say always keep it short. If I'd have had more time, I'd have written a shorter letter. Uh, many people have said this, each in his own way. Among those who have said um, something like this is uh, people like Voltaire, Mark Twain, Ernest Hemingway, even Winston Churchill. Um, so about about Winston Churchill, I will I will I will just uh, uh, talk about a story that I read uh, not 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 too long ago, um, where uh, he said to to uh, you know the organizer of a conference, if you want to want me to speak at the conference for ten minutes, you will have to give me three days to prepare. If you want me to speak for um, for for uh, uh, sorry. Uh, if you want me to speak, yes. So, so let me get this right. Um, he said, if you want me to speak for 10 minutes, I will take three days to prepare. If you want me to speak for an hour, I'll take a day to prepare. If you want me to speak for two hours, I'm ready already. I'm, I'll, I'm ready now. Um, so the point is that if, um, if you have to speak very briefly and you have to capture the essence of what you want to say in, in a few minutes, it takes a lot of work. It's hard work speaking um, briefly and to the point. And this is a fact that every successful writer, business writer or any other kind of writer, he comes to know this or she comes to know this sooner or later in life. Better that it is sooner rather than later. Shorter is almost always clearer, it's better and it's more effective. Um, some, um, some, some sort of examples uh, of uh, brevity. Uh, this, is, this is something that, um, that I use very often. We tested the students under good to excellent acoustic isolation. Very unclear. You're not sure what is being said. All we are saying is we tested the students in a quiet room. Why not um, say it like that rather than 
we tested the students under good to excellent acoustic isolation. No one's impressed. So vigorous writing is always concise, always. Restrict sentences to, uh, and I'm talking about business writing, usually sentences in, in business communication should be about um, 10 to 15 words. And um, every paragraph should have about three sentences or maybe four, not more than that. That's the thumb rule usually. A few more examples. Um, it is a safe assumption to state the idea that the attitudes of our forefathers have affected the entire course of history. Now this sentence, you can delete the first 10 words and it's, it's a more effective sentence. The attitudes of our forefathers have affected the entire course of history. You don't need, it is a safe assumption to state the idea that. It just makes what you're writing verbose. I was trying to make this article friendly and approachable. So I read a few articles for reference, jotted down a few notes. And in order to keep everything as simple as I possibly could, I set out to avoid too many details. Quite a mouthful, this sentence is. You can edit it. I was trying to make this article friendly and approachable. Hence, I kept everything simple by avoiding too many details. Um, so I think the passage um, that I cited first is perhaps about 30 words or 35. Um, the next, um, the edited version is more like 15 words or maybe even 12 or 13. And it's perhaps more effective. Here's another example, cut down on wordiness. This document is for the purpose of giving the reader a detailed explanation of the editing process. It describes the activities we currently do in the majority of instances on a weekly and daily basis. Um, you can change this to document, explains the editing process in detail. It describes our usual daily and weekly activities. Uh, you've cut it down by a third and it's actually more effective. So um, um, one needs to learn in, as a good business writer, you need to learn to do more with less. And, um, and here's uh, the greatest writer of the English language, William Shakespeare, um, who said in the 16th century or the 17th century, he said, brevity is the soul of wit. So that was um, about Brevity, we are doing all right for time, Venkat? Yes, sir. Going going to be maybe a little, yeah. Okay. So um, let's move on to uh, revision. So whatever you write um, in business terms, when you, as a business writer, you write once, you check twice. You write once, you check twice, always. It's always wise to revise. Um, and you should, you should actually revise and revise compulsively. Just keep doing it. Even when you're close to a deadline, give your copy one more read. It's amazing the kind of simple uh, mistakes that escape your eye in the first or the second or the third read. Um, if you keep doing it, you will, you will, um, you know, you will find that uh, you've actually managed to eliminate most of the obvious mistakes. Um, so it's absolutely critical to revise. And you revise to strip away everything except the bare essentials. So it is often the excess of words and ideas, not the lack of them, that dilutes the power of your writing. So the composition of your um, um, writing, um, it, it should imitate the what I like to call the anatomy of a flower. Uh, every part should be necessary and should contribute to the whole of the flower. Some examples, uh, crutch words and, and phrases, they're sometimes called uh, filler words and phrases. They need to be eliminated. If you're a good business writer, you will crush them ruthlessly. Um, here's a sentence. To be honest, I didn't like the way you dealt with the issue of absenteeism. Um, Okay, I don't know what I did there. To be honest is what you can drop here. So to be honest, I didn't like the way you dealt with the issue of absenteeism. 
just cut out these first three words and say, I didn't like the way you dealt with the issue of absenteeism. I literally completed the assignment at the Nth hour. Um, cut out literally and you'll be fine. Uh, I completed the assignment at the Nth hour. So about literally, I, I, I want to say uh, that it's a much misunderstood word. Um, literally means something that is literal, something which is happened, which, um, you know, so when you meet somebody who says, I just came out of this, um, uh, watching this horror film, and I literally died watching it. It's actually a, a, a ridiculous statement, because if you died, you, you, you die. If you literally died, it means you are dead. Um, so every time somebody says that to me, I say you mean metaphorically. You metaphorically mean that the film was so scary that you almost died. Um, so literally is, is a word that is grossly misused. All of us do it. And it's one of those things that we need to be aware of. A sentence, I love this. A sentence is like a mathematical expression. The more it can be simplified, the more beautiful it becomes. So here's a sentence. It goes without saying that one's reading has a strong influence on one's writing. Um, you can edit this and say one's reading has a strong influence on one's writing. You've eliminated five words and what you're saying is more direct. It's more attractive. Um, further, you can change even the second sentence and just say reading has a strong influence on writing. We're saying exactly the same thing, but now we're saying it in even fewer words. And here's even better. Now we're down to just four words. Reading strongly influences writing. That's it. That's all you wanted to say, but you started by saying it in about 12 words. Then you brought it down to about six or seven or eight. Uh, you further brought it down to five or six. And finally, you're down to four words. Do you agree with me? The, the, the last statement um, is, is, is the best because it's short, it's effective, and it's saying exactly what you set out to say. So its sentence is like a mathematical expression. So what, um, what we'll do at this stage um, is uh, 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 Venkat will, will run a poll for us. Um, there are three small exercises um, and uh, I'll, we'll, we'll give you maybe 30 to 45 seconds to answer each one of these three questions. Um, the first uh, question is, what is the definition of mitigate? And there are four choices. You need to um, select the one that you think uh, mitigate means. So let's do that first. The second question is about um, the spelling of the word supersede. Keep going, you should all answer the question. It's interesting, it's fun. And there's a third question too, which we'll come to shortly. So we'll put up uh, the third question as well, Venkat, or a little later. The poll is running, sir. We have all the three questions. The oh, you have all? Okay, I can only see two. Okay. Uh, we have there only... Are, um, there are four sentence choices. Um, only one of them is correct. So you need to identify which one. We've received only 210 responses. I uh, request everyone who can see the poll on your screens to sort of respond. I'll take last 10 seconds for the poll. Last 10 seconds. I see people are raising hands, uh, Shiva, but um, 
we'll we'll take questions at the end right yes sir yes sir so i think uh, we're done with time uh, when could you can end the poll sure okay so um what is the def definition of mitigate um 68 of 68% of you said it's soften or to reduce reduce in severity which is correct um you talk about mitigating circumstances uh some circumstances which which have been reduced in severity so that's the correct answer 68% said work against that word is militate m i l i t a t e e um that means to militate against the state you could say that word is militate not mitigate mitigate means soften or to reduce in severity uh supersede is interesting 40% uh, spelt it with a c and 32% spelt it with an s the correct spelling is uh, uh, 32% said supersede and so supersede is spelt with an s uh there are some dictionaries which will which will accept the spelling with a c as well but um but to be absolutely right you should spell it with um, an s and finally the third um how do i get to the third i can't see it you can scroll it down it just give me a second just scroll scroll down the poll sir we can we can did you scroll down yes i've did it okay i don't see it on my screen uh, sir we'll read it out for you that's okay okay so uh, the first option yeah. now uh, now i see it. now i see it i'll get it uh so there are four choices a product has two distinct advantages semicolon price and durability uh the second choice is our product has two distinct advantages price and durability um this time there's a colon um a product has two distinct advantages comma price and durability um and finally it's two sentences a product has two distinct advantages price and durability uh now 50% of you said comma which is not correct uh, the correct answer is uh, the one with the colon you're talking about two things and you're setting them off with a statement you make so our product has two distinct advantages colon and these two things are price and durability full stop so that's the correct uh, sentence and 22% which is 50 of you said uh, that's the correct sentence and that's actually the right answer so well done the 22% who chose the second sentence yeah okay so we done with the poll i i hope you enjoyed it usually what i do in my sessions is i ask a lot of um, uh, trivia questions relating to the english language the uh, spellings and word definitions and sentences and punctuation and so on and for every answer i come up with a chocolate every right answer whoever gives i come up with a chocolate but this of course happens in a physical setting in a physical classroom setting i don't know what is the methodology of giving a chocolate online <laughs> so so you will have to live without the chocolate but um, let's let's move on i'm going to you see my screen Yes, sir. We can. Okay. Okay. Now, how do I get rid of this poll on my screen? I've already stopped the sharing, so I think it it will not reflect on your screen. Is it reflecting still, sir? Yeah, it is. Uh, just stop sharing. No. if it is reflecting you can just put a uh, there's a button called stop sharing you can just click it
okay what i'll do is i'll i'll stop sharing my screen and then i'll share it again that might solve the problem yeah okay yes so let me share the screen again here we go You see my screen? Yes, sir. Okay. Um, so we talked about um, three or four different characteristics of uh, good business writing. Uh, let's move on to something that I consider absolutely critical for good business writing. Um, and this is what I like to call the hook strategy. Um, what what I'm saying when I say the hook strategy is uh, that you need to hook your reader. Whatever you're writing should get the attention of the person who's reading it. That's always the purpose of writing. Now, the lead sentence that you write and the headline that you provide to what you've written, they hold the key uh, to whether the audience is going to read it or not. Uh, so the lead and the headline hold the key to good business writing. Um, and I like saying that um, spend as much as 60% of your time to find a good lead that hooks the reader. Uh, and once you hook the reader, don't let go. Keep writing, write interestingly, write in a manner that the, uh, the person has no option but to keep reading. That's the purpose of writing. Um, you would be familiar with, uh, with this line, it was a dark and stormy night. Uh, a lot of stories begin with this as the opening line. It was a dark and stormy night, and uh, uh, you know, in 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 sort of um, uh, nursery tales and 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 so on. This is usually the opening line, and the purpose is that the writer is trying to get your attention. So, if I write, it was a dark, dark and stormy night. You'd want to know what happened on that dark and stormy night, which is why it is used. But of course, this is old hat, and certainly in. Uh, business writing, there's no scope for writing. It was a dark and stormy night. Um, but always choose um, a sentence which gets the attention of your um, reader. Um, without a good lead, you are dead. Uh, effective writing needs hooks. So you almost start with your conclusion. What it is that you, uh, you know, your call to action. Uh, business writing is about call to action. Uh, you can start with your call to action. What do you want your audience to do? Start with that and then work backwards, um, which is why I say you can spend as much as 60% of your time finding a lead because if you don't have a good, strong lead, what you're writing will not be read. And if it's not read, your effort is gone waste. Um, these are some examples on the right. Uh, these are It's not from business writing. It's from all kinds of writing. The Bible begins with this sentence. In the beginning, God created heaven and earth. Betty Frieden, Frieden who wrote a book called The Feminine Mystique, which is uh, uh, one of the greatest uh, feminist uh, 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 book on feminism, um, uh, Betty Frieden uh, wrote this book in, I think, the 1970s. The first sentence is, the problem lay buried unspoken for many years in the minds of American women. Uh, Stephen King, who's a prolific writer, who um, I'll talk about a little later also, uh, he wrote a book called The Gunslinger. The opening sentence in that book is, the man in black fled across the desert and the gunslinger followed. And then you want to know what happened when the gunslinger followed the man in black in the desert. Um, Stephen King uh, said in an interview to the Atlantic magazine in the US, he said that he spends months and even years writing opening sentences. Now, this is extraordinary. He's a very prolific writer. He's a very accomplished and, and prosperous writer. Somebody like him saying that he spends months, even years writing opening sentences should tell you why the opening of whatever you're writing is so critical. Um, Lonesome Dove is, um, is, is another book. Um, here, um, the, the opening sentence is, when Augustus came out on the porch, the blue pigs were eating a rattlesnake, not a very big one. 
1984, which is a great novel by George Orwell. If you haven't read it, I recommend that you do. The opening sentence of that book is, it was a bright cold day in April and the clocks were striking 13. Uh, no Country for Old Men, which is, um, which is a great book by Cormac McCarthy, American writer. It was made into a, an outstanding film by the Coen brothers. Um, you should see it if you haven't already. Um, the opening line of the book is, if you told me we'd end up in a world with kids with green hair and bones in their noses, I would have laughed in your face. But here it is. These are all opening lines of, um, of great books. Tom Wolf, um, who died a few years ago, a um, great writer. He wrote a book called The Right Stuff. Um, he, he's, he, you may be familiar with the book that he wrote called Bonfire of the Vanities. Um, his opening line of, from The Right Stuff is within five minutes or 10 minutes, no more than that. Three of the others had called her on the telephone to ask her if she'd heard that something had happened out there. Benjamin Spock has written a book on baby and child care and any, uh, um, you know, anyone, uh, husband and wife who in the family way and the child is on the way, they usually pick up this book. It's, it's that popular. And it starts with this sentence, you know more than you think you do. Irma S. Rombauer, who has written The Joy of Cooking, says, put this puzzle, puzzle together and you'll find milk, cheese, eggs, um, meat, fish, beans and cereals, greens, fruits and root vegetables, foods that contain our essential daily needs. Now, these are all opening sentences of, um, of the books. And the writer has clearly you know, written it in a manner that um, piques your curiosity and you keep reading. And that's, that's, uh, that's the importance of the hook strategy. Uh, also, use active voice when you're writing. There's active voice and there's passive voice. Always try and use active voice because writing should be direct and vigorous. And these are some examples that I've given you just to distinguish active from passive voice. Active voice is that you say, I will always remember my first visit to Kerala. Passive voice is my first visit to Kerala will always be remembered by me. Um, these reports cannot be confirmed. Active voice Passive confirmation of these reports cannot be obtained. Um, so clearly, the active voice is 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 you know a more busy sentence. It's more direct. It's more effective. Um, to give you a, an example that you'd relate with straight away, uh, McDonald's um, they have uh, they have uh, a tagline which is "I'm loving it." So "I'm loving it" is is active voice. If I said it passively, I would say it is being loved by me. So imagine McDonald's coming up with a tagline which says it is being loved by me. It's never going to happen, right? Um, so that's the importance of active and passive. However, in business writing, there are occasions when passive is, is also um, good, um, especially uh, you know, in an instance like this, when you don't know who's done something. So rather than um, you know, say someone stole her car twice, you can say her car was stolen twice. To avoid blaming someone, um, you don't say Shiraz lost, lost the books because you're directly blaming somebody for something going missing. You say the books were lost, which is passive, but it's, it's gentler. Or to soften a directive, if I, as, as your trainer, as your writing skills trainer, I say, shorten this paragraph, it sounds like I'm rasping an order, shorten this paragraph. It's better to say this par paragraph could be shortened, it's more polite. So there are occasions when passive works, but usually it's active voice that you should use. Positivity. Now, this is something which, um, which, which um, I think is very important. And again, a few examples that I've put together. Please send a document to me latest by Wednesday. It's a little more polite than saying, it, than saying don't take longer than Wednesday to send me the document. You're just posing, putting it positively and therefore you are being more polite. Um, say, let's meet first thing Monday morning rather than I'm afraid our meeting must wait until Monday morning. So why say I'm afraid? You know, it's, you sound like um, the voice of doom. Um, 
say, let me clarify what I meant rather than put the blame on the other person and say, you misunderstood what I meant. You, you seem to be imputing motives that the person lacks understanding is therefore misunderstood what you meant. You can say that the problem is with you. Let me clarify what I meant and just say the thing again. Um, say thank you for your contribution rather than say I've received your document or analysis or whatever it is. So positivity in all situations in life works wonders. And um, when it comes to business writing, um, uh, straight, uh, I mean, stress on positivity. Uh, Mark Twain, great writer, American writer, he said, um, writing is easy. All you need to do is cross out wrong words. Um, so it sounds very simple. So, you know, there are words like perspicacious and sagacious. Um, you should avoid these words. It's good to have a strong vocabulary. So you can, you can um, enrich your vocabulary and the stronger your vocabulary is, um, um, you know, more learned and, and so on you are. But when you are communicating, you must use the simplest possible word. So don't say perspicacious, don't say sagacious, just say sharp, which is all these two words mean. Um, don't say rhapsodize, don't say eulogize, just say praise. Um, the team has won the praise of the managing director, for instance. Don't say he's eulogized or he's rhapsodized. Um, so many of these uh, uh, phrases that we tend to use, you know, English language has uh, French phrases that uh, that are very popular. P.S. de resistance and tour de force and, and these sort of phrases. Now, somebody who's not familiar with them will think that you're talking down to them. Um, on the other hand, if, if, you, if you are in a room uh, full of people where um, you know that they understand French, then it's all right to say P.S. de resistance. Otherwise, just say something, you know, which is special. Uh, rather than PS de resistance. Uh, so never talk down to your um, audience. And that uh, is actually pretty much what, what I wanted to say. I, I uh, wanted to include one more characteristic, but I wasn't sure how, how it would work in terms of time. So um, I think we'll, we'll stop here. We'll, we perhaps have a little more time for questions, which, which is... Uh, um, which is welcome. Um, so this was, uh, these were just, just a few tips on better business writing. Like I said, it's not something that, um, that I can talk for one hour and, and, you know, go home claiming, uh, that I, I did my job. Um, this was more, a sort of a sneak preview of the kind of writing skills program that, um, that I do, which is, um, like I said, spread out over, 24 hours. I'm also working on an advanced writing skills program, which equips uh, people who um, attend the program to do long form writing. So thank you very much. I, I greatly enjoyed putting together uh, 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 content for this presentation. This is my email ID, sanjeev at lexisconsultants.com. And that's my uh, hand phone number. Um, I'd love to hear from you. Um, good, bad, indifferent, whatever you thought the session was, if you can let me know, it would be great. Um, and now, Venkat, I think we're open to questions. So you'll, you'll moderate the session, you'll um, let people ask questions. I'm, I'm happy to answer whatever questions come up. Great. Thank you so much for the wonderful inputs that you have given to us, sir. And before we quickly move to the q and section, I uh, would like to take this opportunity to launch a feedback poll to understand how everyone liked the session and also uh, to curate many more sessions like this in the future. So I request all the audience to answer the poll that you see on your screens. And in the meantime, if you want to ask any question to this, sir, you can raise your hands so that I can move you to panel and you can ask your question directly to the sir. And also you can put your questions in the q and section and also in the chat box. I'll be reading out for you all. So we have a couple of hands raised. So, <coughs> sorry. <coughs> Chakravarti, if you can hear me, you can unmute yourself and you can ask your question.
So uh, before Chakravati comes, we have some questions in the Q and A section. Right. Um, yeah, Prerna, I think is asking. I I, I saw her question. Um, when can we use semicolon in a sentence? That's that's her question. So should I answer that? Yes, sir. You can. Yeah. So uh, semicolon is typically used when you are listing a few things. So so for instance. um if you if you if you say that um we will meet three times this week colon monday wednesday friday and friday so you will use a colon in the middle we'll meet three times this week colon monday wednesday and friday full stop um so you typically use it to list a few things that that you are saying um so it it's clear that um, that you know um you are you are elaborating on uh, the first part of the sentence so in the first part of the sentence i've talked about how we'll meet for 3 days and then i'm specifying which those 3 days are so typically that's the use of um, colon if you're interested prerna i can send you a small note on the use of the colon i love uh, these two punctuation marks the colon and the semicolon um semicolon in the in 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 the days of uh, great literature of the 18th century 19th century and so on um, was a wonderful punctuation mark used by jane austen and and um, um, emily bronte and you know all these great writers um, i use it very often in my my writing i love it if if you are seriously interested in punctuation i'd love to write something on on um um semicolon colon particular and of course the the sultan of punctuation is the comma um the there isn't a more uh, important punctuation mark than the comma which punctuates your writing um so on some of this if you are interested i'd be very happy and prerna is saying yes please do i look forward to it so you you'll have to give me your email id prerna and i'll be very happy to do that so we have couple of questions in the q and a section uh, rucha is asking can you elaborate again why adjectives should not be used in business writings because adjectives are uh, are strong statements you you call somebody brilliant in and i i i must qualify what i said uh, i meant specifically in business writing uh, environment when you are you know uh, doing business writing there is no scope for uh calling your work brilliant your own work you should of course never call brilliant or outstanding or whatever that uh, that kind of uh, remark should come from uh, from the client or from the person who is reading what you've written um so use of adjectives is 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 strictly avoidable because it's not germane to what you're saying you should focus entirely on uh, the statement that you're making and uh, that statement is usually by uh, used by making the uh, use of uh, verbs and nouns active verbs and nouns thank you sir we have one more question is how to deal with conflict situations and how to disagree over email when you're specially communicating with seniors how to deal with conflict situations yes in email yeah okay i mean i i i think uh, this 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 would require a very elaborate response i can't i can't respond in you know in a couple of minutes i don't think that's possible um basically what what you should do is if you are in the wrong if you've committed a mistake and that's being pointed out in a complaint that somebody has made to the company you should first accept your mistake unconditionally um unconditionally accepting your mistake tends to mollify the person who is complaining so um that's what you should do just admit unconditionally that you made a mistake and uh, that you will you know uh, look at it further and come up with remedial action um so very often things go from bad to worse because you refuse to apologize it's it's nice to apologize even if you're not in the wrong it doesn't um you know belittle you to apologize so that's something that i can i can say straight away but a more elaborate response to that how to deal with conflict in email requires um a separate session perhaps so venkat you can organize a separate session 
yeah we can do it so that's not a problem and our pleasure that we invite you for many more sessions and one more question is what about great usage of great as an adjective oh avoidable uh, calling calling your company great <laughs> you know others should call your company great you you calling yourself great or your the company that you work for great what what purpose does it serve you know it, it's it's it annoys uh, me greatly when we talk about uh, everything being iconic um uh, so you know amazing incredible great and all these strong adjectives should be reserved for so you can say rabindranath tagore is a great poet or a or a iconic poet uh, but you can't use the the word so so easily for other people in cricket terms you can call sachin tendulkar a great batsman but you can't say you know kl rahul is a is a is a great batsman i mean he may turn out to be by the time he finishes his career but certainly right now you can't say that and he certainly not can't hold a candle to rahul dravid or virat kohli or or whatever sachin tendulkar great we have one more question in the chat box is where we can use the word leverage leverage yeah so to uh, leverage your strengths i will i will say um, um to effectively leverage your writing skills you need to keep it simple that's the that's the use of uh, leverage something that you can use to your advantage is what the word means so we will take a question from audience sir we have nilava das if you can hear me you can unmute yourself and you can ask the question yes, hi sir hi yeah uh so yes it's a really good uh, session and i uh, really enjoyed it so yes sometimes we uh, during the client then sometimes we for the business writing we use this word leverage very frequently sometimes it's uh, it seems like meaningful sometimes it's like some you know uh, it's not exactly matching with that so that's what this I, thing, yeah i agree with you nilva you, you you should actually avoid using it you know like i said if you are absolutely certain about the relevance of a word to what you're trying to say then you should use it but um if if it is if you're talking to an audience which uh, you you're not sure if they understand the meaning of the word it's better to use a simpler word all right all this in all, all situations so leverage is a bit of a buzzword people think that saying leverage you know would make them sort of uh, sound more intelligent and that can never be the reason for using the word okay for example if i'm just just one example like uh, maybe as you said like it should be meaningful like say, asking like this is an advantage we are taking for this thing so in that case uh, can we use that but that leverage word there so we, we are taking advantage for this thing just take one example Uh, so uh, so so for that case can you use uh, replace that advantage with leverage yes because if you say we are going to take advantage of the situation it looks like you're exploiting the situation it's it has a slightly negative connotation right, right. so maybe yes. that, in that sense leverage is better yeah so uh, so it seems maybe like leverage mean... sorry go ahead sorry sir so I, it seems like it's it's more uh, negative or it's positive so that is my concern to un, uh, understand no no leverage is entirely positive entirely all right, all right. Not, no negativity to it it except that it's a buzzword it's a big word which not everybody understands completely so it's <laughs> um, it's it's better to use an alternative but um, but the example that you gave that we'd like to take advantage of the situation it sounds uh, like you're doing something you shouldn't be doing in which case leverage is certainly better okay okay yeah okay thank you sir thanks for that answer sir we have one question in the q and a section is how do you increase the vocabulary for effective technical writing learn um, 10 words a day um that's how i i have uh, expanded my vocabulary since i was i don't know 11 or 12 years old i used to learn 10 15 words a day more than that it's not possible for you to retain especially at you know that age um but 
I have continued to do that. My bedside reading is dictionaries. I read dictionaries uh, cover to cover. Uh, so, but that is highly unusual, of course. But uh, but the only way to increase your vocabulary or to expand your uh, horizons and your vocabulary is by by uh, by learning new words every day. So uh, you you specially asked in the context of technical words. The only way to learn these technical words is to uh, make your acquaintance with them. Pick up five words every day or ten words as much as you can absorb and. Um, and you'll find after, you know, 10 weeks or something that, you know, whatever, uh, 500 more new ones. That's great. Yeah, we have Utkarsh. Utkarsh, if you can hear me, please unmute yourself and you can ask your question. Yes, Utkarsh. It by, by mistake, uh, but just to say, I really enjoy that and it motivates me like that to increase my vocab and to increase like how efficiently I can write the document. So no question, but it like by mistake, I does that, but it's a good session. No, it's a, it's a good mistake that you made. So <laughs> if, you, you. if you, you uh, if you made a mistake and, and said that what a trashy session, it was terrible, I, I wish <laughs> I never attended it, then it would have been a you know, rather depressing, but <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We have one more raised hand from the audience. Uh, Murli Krishna, if you can hear me, you can unmute yourself and you can ask the question. Yes, Murli. Nothing Murli. much, actually. I was uh, raising hand when the poll was happening. I could not see the third question. So that was the reason I raised the hand. Okay. Thanks for the session. Welcome. Welcome. We have. Okay, uh, I see a question in chat, um, which I'd like to take up, um, Venkat. Yes, sir. Uh, Ganesh Pillai has, um, has, has asked me, in your opinion, which is a better way to start a formal mail? Should we write Mr. Stephen or Hi Stephen? So uh, this, is, uh, this is one of my pet peeves. Um, this tendency to uh, say, uh, you know, so uh, Venkat is your first name, Venkat, or is it's it's your surname? It is Venkatesh. Uh, people usually call me Venkat, and my first name is Venkatesh Eduru. That is, this is my full name. Right. So, uh, if I'm addressing Venkat, for instance, uh, I will either use his um, his first name, which is Venkat. I will say Hi, Venkat. But you should never say Mister Venkat if you're going to say. Uh, Mr. If you're going to use Mr., then you will use it with his family name, which is Iduru. Uh, so you will say Mr. Iduru. So either it's Mr. Iduru or it's um, Venkat. Now, when you are addressing people of a certain stature, let's say, for instance, Ratan Tata, you're writing to, um, you shouldn't say hi, Ratan, unless you know him very well, right? Um, so you should always say Mr. Tata. But never say Mr. Ratan, which is totally wrong. And this uh, this tendency to use um, um, you know Mr. with the first name is, I think, a, a bit of a hangover from Hindi pot boiler films of Amitabh Bachchan from 1970s and 80s, where in most films he was called uh, Vijay, um, and he was called Mr. Vijay. Now he was called Mr. Vijay because uh, the the reason is, and I've I've done um, I'm you know I've, I used to um, be a film reviewer. Uh, he was not given a second name in those films because if you called him Vijay Khanna, it would make him a North Indian, and if you called him Vijay Nair, it would make him a South Indian. And <laughs> Hindi films wanted to have a pan India appeal, so they only called him Vijay, and everyone called him Mr. Vijay. <laughs> So we we tend to use um, uh, Mister. So it should never be Mister Stephen. If Stephen has a second name like um, like um, uh, McDonald, then you will say Mister McDonald. Uh, if you know Stephen well enough, um, go ahead and say Hi Stephen. I have answered your question, Ganesh. We have one more question in the chat box. Uh, that is, what are the mediums can enhance the vocabularies? What can enhance a vocabulary? Um, you can 
you can buy the greatest um, resource of the English language, which is the Oxford English Dictionary. It's uh, the best thing that exists in the marketplace. It costs a lot of money, um, but now everything is online, so you can subscribe to it. Um, so that's that's the best resource for in increasing your vocabulary. There are also things like thesauruses, um, so you can you can buy a thesaurus. Um, uh, there are style guides. Every newspaper in the world, every great newspaper in the world, whether it's the Times of London or the New York Times or um, or uh, the Los Angeles Times or what have you, uh, Le Monde in Paris, they, they all have style guides. And um, um, you, can, you can actually get these style guides in, in bookshops. So Wall Street Journal, which is a great newspaper, um, they will have the Wall Street Journal style guide. If you pick up the style guide, it will it will it will tell you uh, about words how those words originated what is the specific meaning of those words along with examples of how you can use those words in certain contexts so that's that's another great way of um, expanding your vocabulary we have a raised hand sir bindia if you can hear me you can unmute yourself and you can ask the question yes bindia In the meantime, there is a question in the Q&A section. Sure. Is there any method or technique to avoid sound like mm, or uh, in speaking? Why do you want to avoid that sound? It's all right. It's natural. Anything that's natural, you shouldn't avoid. Of course, you shouldn't hem and haw too much in between um, You know what you're trying to say. Um, and that comes from practice um, when you speak fluently. But um, but there's no particular need to avoid uh, saying all this. I mean, it's natural, and uh, I always believe that um, you should you should write as you speak. Uh, and I'll I'll give you an example. I I used to work for a newspaper called the Sunday Observer, uh, which is India's first Sunday uh, weekly paper, and. Uh, we had a lady, Rita Manchanda, who was, a, who was one of our correspondents, foreign affairs correspondent. And whenever she spoke at editorial meetings, every newspaper has editorial meetings where you plan the, the next week's stories. And whenever she spoke at these meetings, she spoke brilliantly. I mean, when she spoke, everyone was, there was pin drop silence in the meeting room and we all heard her with rapt attention. And she, as she described the story she wanted to write, but when she actually wrote her story and it came to somebody like me, I was the rewrite person on the desk at Sunday Observer. Uh, when it came to me, it was terrible. It was very, very badly written. So it had to be completely overhauled and rewritten. So we all used to tell Rita that why don't you just record yourself and write as you speak? And we'd have a great, uh, great story. We'd have great copy. We wouldn't need to rewrite it. Um, so, you know, I, I, I'm a strong believer in, in this whole, um, uh, maxim of, uh, writing as you speak. Yeah. We have a question in the chat box, sir. Bina is asking that, can you elaborate write as you speak? Right. Can I elaborate right as you speak? Yes. Uh, yes. How how would you speak? You would you would not say you know you would not speak some of those complicated examples that I gave. Um, you would not speak like that. You you would speak so that the other person that you're talking to understands what you're trying to communicate. That is the sole purpose of speaking, and that should also be the sole purpose of writing. You are writing to be understood easily without much effort by the person that you are writing for. So that's that's it. Just you know, and this example that I gave of uh, uh, Rita Manchanda at the Sunday Observer, uh, that should illustrate what what I was saying. When she spoke, she spoke very convincingly, but when she wrote, uh, uh, it was not convincing at all. So if you if you in more more often than not, if you um, write as you speak, you'll be all right. Yeah. One more question is. Uh... Uh, Yamini is asking that, would you mind to suggest on how to avoid fillers while speaking? 
fillers. What kind of fillers? Yamini. These hemming and hawing, you don't need to avoid. Um, but um, not sure what other fillers you're referring to. I'll try to mourn her to the She's panel. saying something like Okay. Any other questions? Yeah, yes, many, yeah, many, you, me, you can ask your question directly. Okay. So while Yamini um, um, waits to speak, uh, Bina is asking uh, when we speak or write, if we have good vocabulary such as new words, should we still stick to using simpler words? The answer, my answer to that is yes, you must. Um, in business um, uh, environment, always use simple words. So I, I was, um, 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 you know, teaching a, a, a writing skills to a batch uh, recently, where the student said to me that, uh, you know, they they undergone another training program a couple of weeks earlier where the person told them that you must use complex words. You must use difficult words because, um, because that shows how well-read you are. And I think that defeats the purpose of communication. Um, so you shouldn't try and parade, you know, how much you know. Um, you, should, you should always stick to the simplest expression possible. So like those examples that I gave you, perspicacious, it's a very nice word. But how many people will understand perspicacious? So if you just say, you're a sharp person rather than, I mean, if you call me a perspicacious person and I don't know the word, I might think that you're abusing me or you're <laughs> saying something nasty to me, right? So just say sharp. Everyone understands what sharp is, that I'm a sharp person. Yeah. Thank you. Great. Yeah. So, Hi, yes, sir. Uh, this is Yami. Uh, yeah. Thank you for the session. This is really uh, I mean, helpful and engaging. Uh, my question is uh, filler, I mean, is uh, I mean, the filler such as like, I mean, when we tend to use it more frequently in the sentences uh, while yeah. speaking. It's, uh, it's an affectation. It, it becomes a part of the way you speak. Like, and, and I, I know what you're saying. So it's, if you work on it, if uh, you, you, you want to try and eliminate it, don't break your head over it and don't get, you know, very worked up that you must eliminate it. But um, uh, if you work on it gently over a period of time, you will, you will find that it uh, disappears. There was a phase in my life, I think about 10 years ago, where I, I was very fond of saying typically. So whenever I spoke, I would say typically, this happens. And, you know, the next minute I'm saying typically, and I got so sick of saying typically to everybody that I told a couple of uh, friends of mine that every time I say typically, just slap me. I mean, slap me lightly. Don't, don't slap me like seriously, but, um, but just please slap me if I'm saying typically. So actually a couple of friends did that once or <laughs> twice. And, you know, I, I, I reformed myself. I stopped saying typically. <laughs> so maybe you want to try that. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Thank you, sir. You're welcome. Uh, so, so with this, we I think with this we came to an end of the webinar, and uh, thank you so much for answering all the questions patiently. And uh, once again, I thank you for giving many inputs that we need to inculcate all these things in our business writings and even into our day day to day activities. So, thank you all the audience, and thank you so much, sir, for the session. So next week, we will be coming with an, another session on the occasion of Women's Day, International Women's Day. We are coming with a couple of topics about women's. So see you all next week. Thank you, sir. Thank you, all the audience. Good time. Uh, um, I saw in, in the chat box, a couple of people were asking for my contact details. So you will take care of that. Yeah. Sure. sure. I, I'll just drop down uh, that in the chat box itself. It's it's been a great pleasure speaking to all of you and um, and hope to see you again sometime soon. Thank you, thank you, Venkat. Thank you, Shiva. All the best. Thank you, sir.